So, um, welcome to the session bringing your scholarship into the classroom. I'm Celine Marie Pascal. This is Robin Lum Lumsdale, they, excuse me, and Suzanne Zong, um, um, Koba Chemistry Sociology. And uh, we're really excited to talk with you today about bringing scholarship into the classroom. So I want to start by thanking Anna Olson and Betsy Kong, who kind of broke us into this. Uh, we are going to put everything, anything that goes bad, we will put on that. And if it goes well, we'll put on that too, I think. Um, there's a lot of expertise in the room, and we intend to exploit it fully. I think that every discipline is a little bit different. Um, and we have a range of teaching assignments from first year students to doctoral students. So exactly how we engage our scholarship in the classroom is going to change quite a lot. And we'll be able to learn a great deal from more than just the three of us on this panel. So our intention here is to each speak for no more than 12 minutes. And then we're going to open it to the floor. And I'll put up a couple of questions uh, that will help to organize the conversation around uh, how we bring our scholarship in, some of the problems that we have, and successes. Okay? So um, with that, I'm going to turn this over to Robin, who's going to start something. Great, thanks. Just gonna, uh, no, I think it's okay. It's only three slides, and we can have it looks and just full screens. But, okay. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm really pleased to be part of this panel, and in part, um, and, and you'll see the, that I've kind of shifted the title around a bit because the, you know, the session is bringing scholarship into the classroom. But I also think part of that is is how do how do we is it more broadly how do we teach undergraduates through research? And to be honest, when when I was asked to be part of this panel, I've never really had an intentional thought about how to bring scholarship into the classroom. It's, I've always I've always just sort of done it. And so what I liked about preparing for this was actually having to think about that a little bit. Why is it that we bring our scholarship in, what do we want to achieve, what are we trying to do? Um, most of my experience, actually, in engaging undergraduates in research has been outside the classroom. Um, but I do have a few remarks related to the theme. So, so what I'm going to do first is just discuss what we mean by, or what I think about when we think about the scholar-teacher model, um, and then the way in which we can create a research, what I would call a research-rich environment, so an environment that, that you know, creates an interest in research. Um, and then I'll end with some thoughts on how to bring the research into Classroom. So if we can go to the first slide. Um, so I think the, the key thing when we think about the scholar-teacher model, scholar-teacher means different things to different people, um, and I so often hear it um, being being used as as a sort of an either-or proposition, right? And I really do think of scholar-teacher as complementary, not contradictory. And and one of the main reasons for that is actually just practical. Our life is much much better, much easier if we're not trying to balance or do two things that are at odds with each other. Um, so I think it's important to think of, of sort of, you know, the, I don't know if yin and yang is the right way, but just two sides of, of who we are. We're scholars and we're teachers. Um, and it's important for, I think, to all our various uh, constituents, whether they're colleagues, whether they're um, students, to, to see both sides of us in, in what we do. Um, I think the second thing is it's important to bring our expertise into the classroom. And I'm in a business, I'm in the business school. Um, I've taught in arts and sciences before. This is my first time teaching in the business school. But I have a lot of colleagues who um, have practical experience. Um, and I have a little bit of that, but who have had a whole career, for instance, being outside. They naturally, I mean, they were hired to bring their expertise into the classroom. They naturally bring their expertise into the classroom. If I think about what we as academics do, we also have expertise. Our expertise is our scholarship. And so it makes sense to, to equally bring that into the classroom, just as every other one of our colleagues who maybe have uh, outside experience naturally bring their expertise in the classroom. Um, I think the other thing is that, um, so, so one of the things that, that's important about bringing our research into the classroom, we're talking about our research in the classroom, is also to help students understand what we do all day. I mean, I remember when I first started teaching, you know, if, if we talk to folks who teach at, at you know, lower levels of education, they really are teaching in the classroom, you know, sort of 8 to 5, 8 to 6, sometimes they're working on lesson plans until midnight, all day long. Student, students or, you know, other people, uh, their parents as well, come to, you know, university, and they see that we're teaching 5, maybe 10 hours a day, plus, you know, this preparation. But that seems really not very much relative to what the common perception of a teacher is. 
And so it's really also helpful for students to understand, you know, while I'm doing this, I'm also trying to, um, uh, to, to perfect my craft by going to conferences, writing papers, doing research, um, you know, looking for data, collecting data, etc. And so, so I think the more we talk about what we do, the, the more it helps the student to understand our breadth as well. And it, 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 I find that it makes them more understanding about the fact that I can't respond to them 24-7. Um, so I, I think that's a quite helpful thing um, as well. I think the final thing that's important about being the scholar teacher is, is potentially inspiring students to pursue careers in education. And I very intentionally said education and not academia or not as a professor, um, because you know in reality, most students aren't going to follow us in our careers. Um, but, but you know, in some ways, learning and education is a lifetime pursuit. It's something that happens both inside the classroom and outside the classroom. And so we can inspire our students to want to um, educate as well, again, in whatever career they pursue. I think that's something that's going to be uh, sort of beneficial going forward. Um, I've just come back from Atlanta where I was at a, our, our sort of annual meetings. And one of the things that was wonderful there is I, I had two very nice meetings. I met my undergraduate advisor, who was my advisor from 30 years ago, that I've stayed in touch with um, because he inspired me. I mean, he was the first person who said, have you ever thought about grad school? I never had. Um, and sort of inspired me into this sort of path of, of being here. And I also met one of our former AU students that I taught, um, must be now six years ago, who is finishing her PhD um, and is going on to become a, a, a professor. Um, and so it just really sort of illustrated um, the, the career worth of learning and, and the, the influence that we can have beyond just the class that we teach if we think about, um, you know, again, just letting the students know a bit more about ourselves and, and what, uh, what caused us to pursue the path we did. Um, so I think the, you know, the, the key thing about talking about our research is that it helps students to see that we've embraced a career of lifelong learning. Um, and so, this, so, so I think that goes to the next uh, slide, which I sort of wanted to highlight what I think the three most important things that I can teach a student in my class are. And, and those three things have nothing to do with the topic that I'm teaching. I taught a lot of different topics. Hopefully the students are learning something that they take away that's tangible related to that topic. But I think more importantly than that, I think the most important, more than any single item related to my class, the most important thing that I can teach a student is, is the importance of being intellectually curious. Um, and you know, in some ways, I broke that down into three different parts. I think one of the things that's important is understanding how to read critically and formulate questions. So, so much of what students are doing when they're reading is trying to absorb and retain information. And I see this particularly when um, moving to graduate students or even bachelor students who are writing theses or, or reaching the, the ends of their career, is it takes a real shift to, to have students read in a critical way, right? And I basically say to my students, it's not about what's written there, it's about what's missing. Right? We have to, when we read, we have to think about what isn't in what we're reading. That's how we start by how we start to formulate questions, right? Thinking about what's not on the page as opposed to focusing on what is on the page. Um, I think it's important to consider multiple perspectives. I mean that at some level is sort of a buzz phrase, uh, but I really do think that's important. And, and one of the things that uh, I do in classes is we you know sort of share uh, different experiences. I teach international finance. Every student has had, or most students have had some experience with some other kind of currency. We talk about those different currencies. And then I talk about my research um, related to the, the topics that we're talking about uh, in international finance. I happen to be lucky to come from a social science, um, economics, uh, and so basically, you know, the, the standard stereotype of economists is, is there's always on the one hand and on the other hand. So, so we don't really have um, particularly didactic um, answers to things, we really do have, you know, some folks uh, in the literature will say this and others will say uh, that. And so it makes it, it, it lends itself very nicely to, to, to uh, encourage multiple perspectives. Um, and then, of course, the, the other thing that I think we probably all do in the class is, is just emphasize the importance of evidence to support the argument. Um, I'm, you know, very clear in class, fine, you know, I, I will, I, what I tend to do is I basically say, you won't, that's, if we're debating a topic, like, um, you know, should um, should we allow for free trade or something like that? I'm not. You're not necessarily going to know my views. I'm going to interject comments to balance out the discussion. So if I see the whole class shifting one way. I'm just going to provide the other perspective, um, and that doesn't necessarily mean it's my view. It's just so that we have we can have a consistent debate. Um, I also have assigned students different perspectives. So I taught a course on the global crisis, 
and I had four different groups. So I had consumers, um, the central bank, international um, constituents, and government. And over the course of the semester, everybody rotated across those different groups. So basically said, you know, this allows, this creates a sort of safe space to, to talk about perspectives that may be yours or may not be yours, but that way it gets represented. So um, I think the second key thing is don't be afraid to admit there are things you don't know. And it's, it's surprised, it continually surprises me how limiting the fear of failure can be, uh, particularly to a student. It prevents students from asking the questions that would help them to learn. Um, and so one of the key things in talking about our research is that by being intellectually curious ourselves, we help students to do the same. Right? So talking about how we didn't know something and then figured out the ways to, um, to pursue it or to, um, to, to investigate and learn about it is actually sets a helpful example for the students as well. Um, so, um, and, and I think the other thing is being able to admit to a student that you don't know something allows you to experience the joy of learning together. So I remember my undergraduate thesis advisor um, who, when I first went to, to talk about, okay, I need to speed up, to talk about a topic, but basically sort of saying, here's, um, here's a bunch of topics uh, that you can work on, and it'd be great if you worked on this one because I don't know anything about it. I'm sure he didn't use those exact words, but that was how I relayed it to my friends um, when I was shocked about this, this revelation. But the thing that was wonderful is we did, we learned together, um, you know, especially as an undergraduate thesis, basically we know enough to be able to help to guide uh, inquiry. Um, and so that was a very good approach to basically, you know, to, to say, here's something I don't know either. I'd love for you to tell me about it. Um, okay, and then, and then having the confidence to learn, nothing's more rewarding than having a problem that ultimately you were able to solve, whether it's something, a nearly impossible calculus problem, putting together pieces of furniture, whatever. So having problems that, that ultimately lead uh, to a student realizing that they can solve things, I think culminates or helps to build this, this notion of uh, the spirit of inquiry. Okay, so finally talking about research um, in class. I think one of the key things to emphasize is use a textbook that values research if those are out there. So I was very careful to choose a textbook that is what I view as pedagogically compatible with my own views. And in particular, my textbook has a point-counterpoint feature that, that, that highlights debates between two fictitious bro brothers who, who debate economic issues. I like that because, again, it helps me to emphasize that, that a lot of difficult questions, there are no right answers to just how we put forth the different arguments. Um, discuss your own research. So, so my research tends to be highly quantitative, and so it's, it's, it's sometimes difficult for me to find uh, students from AU that can assist in my research in a substantive way. Uh, but I'm lucky to be from a field where everyone has an opinion. And so in some ways it's easy to discuss these topics in a sort of non-quantitative way. And if you start by, you know, for me, if I start by doing that, that often leads them to want to learn more. Um, I think uh, encourage interest in research. One of the practical challenges I know that you have uh, one more minute. Um, one of the one of the practical challenges that we have is or that I've seen certainly in dealing with the millennial generation is that students don't want to do boring stuff, right? They all want to, you know, the, the, the way I said in the business school is they all want to start off by being the CEO, and that's just not so practical, right? So, so one of the things to do is, is that you can make even tedious tasks interesting. Um, so you know, if I have students doing a data collection or a lit review, one of the things I do is schedule time in that to discuss what we're doing. It's not just you know go gather all these articles and then you know thank you, but you know as you're gathering them, find one that you think is interesting. Let's talk about that. Let's discuss uh, what's in there. Um, I think the other thing uh, to do is identify and encourage students early in their careers. I mean, as I mentioned, that was something that was important uh, for me that I was, you know, sort of identified somewhat early and was able to then uh, shift my career and focus into, into academia. Um, but in some ways, um, you know, having identifying your students in their first year, the student that I met with in Atlanta, she had taken a class with me as a freshman um, and then, you know, went on to pursue this career. And some of it is, is I think, She's not doing anything related to what I specifically taught her, but hopefully I had a role in, in, in creating the intellectual curiosity that led her to pursue uh, this career. Um, so, uh, so you know, and again from the business school, we, we highlight internships a lot. Why should internships only be off campus? Right? Why can't we have internships that involve our research and engage the students in working with us um, to, to to learn in the same way? Uh, so, with that, I'll be in there. Thank you.
Well, uh, Robin is pro providing the uh, uh, perspective from the business school and the social study perspective. I am going to change to more uh, from natural science perspective, right? So in natural science, obviously, the, uh, it's it's kind of uh, natural to combine your own work with what you are teaching. For example, I am teaching a, a advanced level analytical chemistry course that related to uh, using different kinds of instruments to do different kinds of measurements and also relating to a specific field in chemistry, which is called electrical chemistry. Well, just like uh, my students, they will ask me, what's that? Right, and it's pretty easy because uh, we, every one of us, have a cell phone. In your cell phone, you need power. And where's the power coming from? You have a battery, and the battery is a perfect example of electrical chemistry. It means that uh, you use electrons to do chemistry, or you use chemistries to generate electrons. So uh, that's why I think the uh, all the natural science is very easy to what. Well, very natural to incorporate your scholarship, bring your scholarship into class. And the uh, Robin has touched on a lot of uh, uh, points about why we need to do that, right? And one uh, which I echo very strongly is uh, one is to help students to read critically and think critically. Because very often when we teach in a classroom, it's very often the students just take whatever you say is the ultimate truth, right? But in research, it's the other way, right? And you set up, let's say you have a hypothesis, and you need to do research to verify it. And that's the kind of thinking we need to build into students' mind. And when they learn about a theory, they need to know what's the background, what's the limitation of the theory, and What's the boundary that uh, the the law applies to, and beyond that law, it doesn't work anymore. And why, right? And in research, is in a similar way. You have this hypothesis, and you do experiment to prove or disapprove your hypothesis. And that's the kind of thinking we need to build into the students' mind, and so that when they read about something in the newspaper or in the uh, media, they know where to find the correct answers. And that's very critical for, especially in these days, right? And so I think that's one of the uh, uh, reasons I think it's important to bring scholarship into classroom. And another point that Robin uh, brought up is uh, to give students a better understanding of what we do as a, a teacher scholar, right? It's very often, even when you talk to your neighbor and say, oh, I teach in you, I'm a professor in you, very often what they ask is, what do you teach, right? And that's the perspective that people have, is your professors we are teaching. That's all. Right? But we actually do scholarship, and so we need to say, you know, in addition to teach, I also do this and that, research this and that, right? And that gives the students a more uh, better understanding of what a professor's life is really is. And then they also have a better understanding of uh, where we are coming from when we teach them certain things in a certain way and also the, uh, how we spend our, our day, right? And the, uh, it's also very often that when we do scholarship, we are at the forefront of our field. But when we teach in the classroom, it's all the way down to the bottom, right? You're, you are teaching the building block of the field. And sometimes it could be very boring, and sometimes students feel like this is very old stuff, right? How do I make connection between this very old theory with what's going on in my daily life, right? And the, the scholarship is a good bridge to connect those two. For example, when we talk about battery, that's a very old concept, right? But when we talk about fuel cell, that's more upfront, more related to our modern day life, 
uh, lithium battery, right? That's what's in your phone. And so when you do that kind of uh, uh, connection, which is happened to be my research is developing fuel cell catalysts for hydrogen fuel cells, and which are the the cleaner way to drive your car around, right? And when they see that connection, then they they understand why we need to learn these more fundamental things and then gradually building up to more advanced uh, uh, concepts and also something more closer to their daily life. Right, so that's uh, uh, I, I see that bringing scholarship into classroom as uh, a bridge to connect the more abstract theory to more apply and forefront uh, research area that uh, students may feel like you know it's more likely. Right, so that's another way to look at the bringing scholarship into classroom. And in terms of uh, how we do this. As I say, in natural science, sometimes it's very natural because uh, uh, when you talk about a theory or a, a subfield, it's related to what you are doing. It's very easy to talk about your research. And uh, the, the, the challenge is that uh, when you do research, obviously you are an expert in that field. But when you are teach to an undergraduate student, they have no idea what you are talking about. Right, so how do you make it more understandable to students? That's the challenge that we have to face and to tackle, right? And the easiest way is just like uh, perceive it as uh, you are giving a very general talk to a broad audience well, with some uh, science background, right? And one good way to do that, um, I think we have a program at AU that uh, uh, we are invited to give lectures to prepare release. And I forgot the name of that uh, program. Something with L, L, a lot of L's, learning something lifetime. And <laughs> yeah, all, yeah, okay, thanks. <laughs> and I happen to give a talk there, and it's actually very fun to teach in that environment because these are uh, the students that the perfect students you can ever get because they keep asking you questions, right? And they are very curious about, they are very enthusiastic uh, <coughs> about the uh, topics you are talking about. And that is a way to to talk about what you are doing. And it's actually a lot of fun and very exciting to, to do that. And that's a way to, uh, to it yeah, also helped me to think how I should approach my undergraduate students and students that they are interested in these topics. With, uh, the, the questions being asked there is actually, I respect that coming from my students in my classroom too, but very often they are not. Right? So how do I uh, stimulate that kind of interest is something that uh, I think is uh, work on. And the, uh, um, also the, uh, in terms of engaging students in research, uh, once you the students see what the impact, especially the social and economic impacts of youth research to the society, they usually will have a, a tendency to feel like you know this is something meaningful and more interesting than the, the very basic theory of chemistry, right? So they, they tend to that will tend to uh, stimulate their interest in pursuing the research career and then they will Oh, very often they will come back to me and say, you know, how can I learn more about this field or how can I uh, get involved, right? So that's how we can recruit students into uh, in researching on that. I think Monica has a lot of experience on that. And she has many undergraduate students in the lab. And so that's uh, uh, something that uh, uh, we can do individually in our classroom. And in our department, we also have uh, two uh, sequence classes that's designed for students to explore a scholarship. And we call it advanced laboratory, and it's a two uh, semester sequence class. The first semester, students learn how to do basic uh, chemistry measurements and use uh, some of the instrumentations they need for their, the kind of research we're doing. In the second semester, students propose a project that they will pursue in that second semester. 
It's of their own ideas and it's built on the uh, previous year's students' uh, results so that uh, they are now straight away from all various topics that is out of control. And also, um, the, the, the professor who is teaching it should be uh, able to control where the, uh, uh, the direction, general direction is and also control how much cost it be, and also the, the time that is the set the goals that uh, they can actually finish in one semester. So that's a very fun course to teach, and that's also where we can bring our expertise in because that, that's why you guide the student to do what kind of research that uh, uh, they can see. It's that's also very close to what the individual professor is teaching that class is doing. So that's the kind of uh, activity we can also implement in our curriculum. As a natural combination of undergraduate course and scholarship, right? And that brings also bring your own scholarship into the class. And in fact, some of our faculty members uh, was able to uh, 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 produce a couple of papers with a lot of undergraduate co-authorships there. And that's another way to bring scholarship into the classroom. Okay. Um, I think that's pretty much uh, what I have to share with you. I'm pretty sure you have your own experience that we can uh, exchange and share. Right. Thank you. Thanks, both. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I have just three very general points that I would like to present before we open it up for conversation. Um, and these actually draw upon uh, Anne Barron's uh, comments from this morning. I must be psychic, who knew we were on the same wavelength. Um, I think that what distinguishes professors from any other kind of teacher is in fact our scholarship. And that um, it is what makes us professors. And it's incredibly important that we get to bring that into the classroom in some form. Um, it's obviously it's a kind of a no-brainer. But with that said, I want to also acknowledge that not all faculty have the same opportunities for bringing their scholarship into the classroom. Often adjunct and term faculty are hired to teach whatever is needed. Um, and it's also possible that in some departments, faculty get hired in and assigned to teach classes that have nothing to do with their area of expertise, as was my case. I, I would focus on interaction. And my first courses assigned to me in my department were global sociology, which I had no idea what to teach, um, so that I was asked to approach it as a teacher rather than as a scholar. And I think that that cleavage, um, what both Robin and um, Shosaki got to, is that it's a really important thing that we're not cleaved from our scholarship in that way. So I want to acknowledge that um, that this is a a conversation about. What ought to be a no-brainer, but for many faculty, it's not. That there are kind of layers of power and privilege uh, laced through these conversations. And that, for me personally, my pedagogical orientation is inseparable from my epistemological orientation. Right? How I come into the classroom, what I teach, really is based on the same set of assumptions that I bring to the field when I do my scholarship. The second point that I wanted to make regards whether or not we assign our own scholarship in a classroom, is that that's been a topic of debate for a lot of us. Um, for some people, uh, I've been encouraged by many faculty to always assign an article of my own so that students know what I'm doing, that they're familiar with my scholarship, and that, um, as um, Robin and Jose had mentioned, it kind of brings another dimension to the classroom. I think that that's an incredibly important thing to do. And we ask students to be critical consumers of information. So if I'm going to assign one of my own articles, I have to be willing to hear it torn apart by students. Now, faculty are pretty much thick skinned. We're used to being criticized from people all over who may or may not know what they're talking about. but. When we take that criticism from students, it puts us in a position as faculty 
of having to respond in a really skillful way because what uh, in addressing concerns that may not be valid points to our thinking can come off as being really defensive and it can set up a, an unfortunate dynamic that affects learning in the classroom. So think about this as a learning environment that uh, we're trying to cultivate. So um, that's the second point. And I want to make a distinction here about books because faculty sometimes assign their own books in the classroom. And for myself, uh, I find that this is a practice that I'm not very comfortable with because I really value intellectual diversity. And if I have, you know, as we walk into the classroom, we have a lot of control, a lot of say so, even though we may feel out of control a lot of the time, um, to assign our own work as a book can really <coughs> narrow the intellectual scope of the classroom. It can narrow the debates, it can, um, you know, students sometimes feel a little crabby about having to pay for their faculty's textbook, and uh, it just, to my mind, really narrows things in a way that suffocates rather than enlarges the classrooms. Uh, but you may have other experiences, and I'd really be happy to hear from you about if you've done that and had some success with it. The third point that I want to make is that I teach primarily undergraduates, and I have co-authored a number of papers with undergraduates, and the trick for me has always been um, grabbing them early, that finding a student who's in their second year tends to be kind of ideal because the first year is a panic for students, what am I doing? finding your peer groups, and then in the second year being able to build a relationship that by their third and fourth years, we can co-author together. And I find that very rewarding. Um, in graduate, working with graduate students, um, both MA and doctoral students tend to have their own research agendas that are going strong, and I see myself trying to support and mentor them rather than bringing my research agenda to them. So, unlike the field of chemistry where it would be pretty much impossible to look left or right as a doctoral student without knowing what your mentor was doing and working on that project. Um, our projects in sociology often are a little bit different from one another. Um, I'm really sorry that uh, one of my colleagues is not here. I have to say that I recently returned to the department and I've learned a lot from Ernesto Castaneda about ways to invite students into your research and ways to bring your research into the classroom that I had never considered before. So I have to count myself as a little outdated when I look at um, uh, some of my colleagues and I look forward to learning from them as I look forward to learning from all of you. I wanted to um, turn the conversation back to all of you, not just to ask questions, which probably you don't have many questions, I would guess, at this point. But I'd really like to hear some of the successful strategies that you've used to bring your scholarship into the classroom. I'd like to know what are some of the particular complications that you've encountered that you've had to work around, and are there any horror stories out there that we should know about so that we can avoid them? So with that, I'd like to kind of turn the conversation um, to the other side of the table and you know, invite more of a dialogue and more of a learning community around issues of bringing our scholarship into the class. Yeah. So, uh, Would you please take your name? Uh, Jeff Sosselin, and uh, I teach at uh, Specs. I, I teach international business, but my research is on um, the politics of water in the Middle East. Um, and I've, had the opportunity to teach a couple of electives to juniors and seniors, but this is the first semester where I'm teaching a complex problem class about water scarcity to freshmen, second semester freshmen. And um, I, I initially, when I put my syllabus together, I included it in my book um, and ended up taking it out. Uh, I always was self conscious in it about having students buy a book, but now my book is accessible to the library, the, any version that you can get for free, so I don't feel bad about them. Not that I ever made any money off my book anyway. Right. But, uh, <laughs> we know yeah, that. Yeah, that, that whole guilt of making them, and I, I, but I think um, 
the issue is, especially with freshmen, even with juniors and seniors, is the level of research that, that we do is it, it, it's just too specific. And they, to, to, well, I think my book is makes a contribution to the literature, and I can bring that into the class. I think when push came to shove, I just thought that there were better texts out there, for definitely for freshmen, but even for uh, juniors and seniors. Um, but uh, but I'm interested in hearing what other people are, are you know, the, the internal debates that people have had about that because it's really something that I've, I've struggled with. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that's another hand. I have something to ask. But go ahead. Uh, one of the things I wanted to say, so, so my background is econometrics, which is very quantitative, and but my research is, some of my research is related to factors affecting retirement decisions, pension plans, and aging. And so, yeah, can I talk to you after? <laughs> sure. <laughs> so when I started teaching, I mean, one of the things that you know, when people ask what to dream course, I always wanted to, to teach an economics of aging course. Although my whole life as an assistant professor, I was teaching econometrics. So when I got tenure, basically said I want to teach this economics of aging course to freshmen. And everybody, all my colleagues said. You know, they have to have micro, they have to have macro, they need the, um, the, the tools before you can teach this sort of specialized <coughs> quantitative topic course. And it's the only time, I mean, as I said, now I teach, you know, a course to juniors and seniors, I use a textbook. For my freshmen, I pull together articles. And one of the things I realized is that they don't need to know the derivation of, you know, and the proof of the properties of, you know, estimates and a logic equation. I can still explain to them how to interpret the coefficient, the numbers that they're seeing, and you know what significance means or not, and, and things like that. So, so in that sense, I actually was able to bring much more of my research in. But, but again, talking at a sort of less quantitative level than I would for for more advanced students. But I often think, and there was something I wanted to ask the group, is for your own disciplines. What do you think about sort of? It's it's a, it's a different kind of flip, but in some ways, starting off with the topics that are interesting. And then going on to the foundations, because I'll give another example. My husband's a, a physicist, a cosmologist, and I got to say, when I took physics, you know, dis, you know, disrespect to the scientists, but you know, we're talking about these little blocks on a plane and the forces of friction that are, you know, sort of, and it was just completely uninteresting, right? When I hear about the early universe, the you know, radiation left over the Big Bang, well, honestly, if I had a course that described that, I might have become a physicist. So, so in some ways, I do think that that you know, starting off by grasping, you know. The, the topic that's interesting, and there's nothing honestly more interesting to us than our research, you know, that passion comes through in the classroom, and, and maybe that inspires students to then, you know, to, to first of all realize the stuff they don't know, and then want to go and learn it. Um, so that's my thought on, on, on. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, oh, did you? Oh, yeah, sorry. I, oh, oh, sorry. Oh, uh, I want to ask something different. I think these are good topics, but I have some fundamentally really different question. And it, I don't know if I buy the premise of scholar teacher. Um, and it's certainly when we hire faculty and in our own desires as faculty, we want to be the very best for both of those as best we can. But I'm not sure that at some, and, and this has to do with the level of your class, and I uh, mentioned a little bit of that. At the intro level classes that we teach, uh, I had in my intro class a few years ago, but the individual who taught it was simply creative, engaged, passionate, and at that time, we all know it. They weren't a scientist. Uh, they were uh, they were a splendid, phenomenal teacher. Uh, I don't think teachers have to be scholars in the sense of having a scholastic pursuit. Uh, looking at fuel cells, or in my case, looking at the brain. Uh, if they are, that's great. But I think if we, if, we, if we peg it to only those that teach have to have a scholastic pursuit, I think we sell a lot of people short. Uh, that's just the perspective I have on that. Furthermore, there are wonderful scientists who are stars in science who don't want to teach. Uh, the university has a place for both those two people, uh, both the ones that are phenomenal teachers who don't do scholarship, 
and for phenomenal scholars who don't teach. I don't think that's the case at higher level classes. But I think at the lower level classes, I have never been in the situation where I, as a chair, when I was chair for 13 years, painful, tedious years, I like to add, as I was chair for 13 years, uh, I didn't make assignments to that intro class based on scholarship. I based assignments to that intro class on people who were engaged with students who were very smart, and it, but it never crossed my mind to put someone who was a splendid scientist or researcher into that slot. I put someone who, and there's a lot of self-titration in, in, in administration where you, you put things that work. And, and so I think that as at the lower level classes, I think we can, we can put people into corners that aren't good corners sometimes. I think it's a great conversation to have. Uh, I understand how you feel about it. Um, I have a very different perspective on it based on my own experience of trying to teach something that I really didn't know beyond the book. Um, no, I don't think that's bad at all. I, 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 I think that's healthy. So uh, I, but but, I, but at the lower level, I, and, and especially when you get to intro level classes, is that it's, it's oftentimes fun to go in there with as a blank slate. Yeah. Uh, and, and trust me, I, I've done that many times. Uh, but I think that if we only are looking for a subset of people that have both of those things, and, and, and hinted at that this morning, I don't know if I'm going to put words in the mouth, but I don't know whether that's an individual faculty member's decision or that's an administrative decision about the scholar teacher idea. Uh, that individual faculty, as Ann mentioned, and as I said, all of you have mentioned, is that passion we bring to our classes. And at a, at a level when you're teaching fuel cell construction or derivation or whatever you're doing, if you don't know that, you can't teach it. You just can't teach it. Uh, and so having a scholarship in that area is fundamentally critical to those levels of classes. But I think that we tend to decide up front, this is the model that should be done. I think that's the level above my pay grade that says this is, the, this is the approach that we should take and try to put everybody into that. Okay. I want to open up the conversation and put it kind of back into the room. I could well, go have coffee. <laughs> talk about this because I think it's you're raising really important issues, but I want to make sure that everybody has a chance to to, to talk about it. So excuse me for uh, not coming back. Yep. Nicole, I think you got a hand. And there's another hand up over here. Yeah, I just had a question about um, uh, other folks' ex experiences. With it. I, I think this is probably particularly true with those of us. Well, not those of us because I haven't written a book, but who think or have signed a book. But even when I think about signing my articles, is how do we? Especially with uh, freshmen or um, sort of the real younger undergrads, how do we really encourage sort of constructive debate and criticism when we're signing our own work? And there's that kind of fear of you know I, how are we limiting stu limiting students' ability to actually raise questions that they think are not in line with you know mm -hmm. our own sort of epistemologies or so I guess how is it that assigning our own scholarship can limit the type of conversations and intellectual development and curiosity that we want to see happen in our classrooms um, without getting them to think they have to subscribe to you know whatever it is that we've argued elsewhere? So I was just wonder if other anyone's had that um, because a few times I've assigned an article I've not gotten any general sort of <laughs> criticism <coughs> or um, more sort of you know questions that I don't think were all that critical. Um, so I don't know how useful it really was. Can well, anybody in the room speak to that? Well, I can try um, to answer your question. It depends on the level. Mm -hmm. it, it all comes to, um, you know, it's kind of like a permit. In order to be able to go to certain topics, if, if the people are not very equipped to know how to critique, they don't have the background to do it. They might be stopping them from doing so. That's the only thing that I can think of at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, for example, freshman people most likely would not going to have the same knowledge as sophomore or senior, so therefore, and the confidence is not there yet. So that might be the, the only reason for, for that. It's not pure work, it's just 
it's the level of a understanding and knowledge that we will have and bring. Mm -hmm. The other thing I can suggest is if you have, I mean, you know, in the path of inquiry, you know, I, I certainly have examples, and then they, again, I would say that maybe out of 40 articles, one or two might be mine, so it's not like I'm assigning an entire syllabus in one. But inevitably, I've got articles where I have, you know, one set of findings, and then later on, continued on that topic and had another set. Or, you know, at the, for a lot of our articles, the last paragraph is always like, here's some future research uh, ideas, or here's what I want to show in the future. So, so just helping them to see, okay, well, here's, you know, I critique myself, mm -hmm. you know, and, and notice that there were some deficiencies, here's <coughs> how I resolve it, and then right. asking them, you know, and just sort of, you know, if, if they recognize your path of scholarship, it's basically saying, well, you know, I went and gave a seminar, had all these criticisms, that's helped me to write this paper. Now I'm asking you to, to provide similar feedback mm -hmm. uh, that will help me in my scholarship. Mm -hmm. But the, the, um, the, the conflict that I always deal with is, you know, I think that I, like you, I have, you know, the general, the topic that I do research in, or one I do research for a lot of number, a lot of different sort of things, corruption, which is, you know, we, everybody, oh, that's really interesting. Everybody's interested in that. But when you actually get to the research, it's, the robustness of my results from one economic technique versus another. <laughs> it's so only you know, you run the other economic technique is do a robust and then add a you know footnote to the table. Um, it's that's I mean actually I like doing that, but most people don't and my students, except for PhD students, um, are are really even master students are not interested. Um, so, in other words, the conflict for me between bringing my research into the classroom is that the, the general question is always interesting of the nuts and bolts of the, what I, the day-to-day -day research is, that's really not so, it's not easily acceptable. And that's the conflict that I, so I often just, you know, don't really say anything much about my own research. Um, because it's I guess uh, yeah. part of uh, bringing your scholarship in class is of uh, the uh, your your uh, approach to a problem mm -hmm. is more of methodology instead of more of the content, right? Sometimes right. it's so how you perceive. It is uh, right. It's how you uh, how you address this problem from what angle and from what approach, and how you solve that problem. And this thought thinking that uh, uh, you would like to plan into the next brain and see, you know, that's how I approach this problem. And maybe when you encounter similar problem, you can use this approach as well. Instead of okay, this is the uh, problem that uh, is econometric and it's, you know, <laughs> it's it's not just that. Content-wise, it's more of a general approach. And I also think, I mean, in some ways, the you know the robustness test specifically, not to get too specific into my field, but I mean, one of the things you know, when, when we talk about evidence to support the argument, one of the things I always try to emphasize to the students is, you know, bias the argument against yourself. That only makes things stronger. Like the more you can represent the opposite perspective, the more compelling your argument will be. And so that's the reason to yeah. go down this path. It seems tedious, it's, you know, we're checking every little thing, you know, but, but actually if the results are sensitive it's to that, it's better for you to know that than for someone else to point it out in, in you know, some publication that criticizes your work. Um, so you can still use that, I think, to illustrate, you know, here's, here's why we do this. I think it's important to understand sort of the, the power asymmetry that exists in the classroom. And it's one thing when a student will be reading an article or a book and challenge, trash that argument and feel free to do that. It's another thing when that person is sitting in the room and is going to be giving you a grade at the end of the semester and you have to worry, well, if I trash his or her argument, am I going to get a lower grade because, I'm, because he'll take it or she'll take it as an insult? Uh, because when I was thinking about these previous classes and 
why I felt that the debate was a little bit muted. That was something that I, I sort of went back to. And maybe they were just trying to, they thought that they were just being polite. And, and, and by not being, but that's not what you want in the classroom. You want, you want them to be a little that they can do that. And, and sometimes maybe by including your work, it, 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 it could have that unintended for them. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, perhaps you can, uh, you can view your scholarship more broadly. It's not just your own work, but it's your area of work. Let's say, for example, if you're afraid of bringing your own work into the discussion of the class, you can bring your uh, colleagues and your peers' work into the classroom. And one example is, uh, let's say, uh, I read an article published in a paper, uh, in a journal, and then I saw there are some obvious flaws in the argument. We can use that as an example in the classroom and then, you know, help students to identify what are the flaws and then that way that you don't, students are not feeling, you know, awkward to criticize the article, but from your perspective, you're still teaching them, you know, how to identify the the flaws in the in the article, how to approach, uh, how to uh, read it more critically, even if that paper is already published and under the uh, peer review, but you can still see there are some flaws there, right? So that often happens in the uh, in, in in the field that I'm working on. You know, some people are experts in developing materials, but they're not necessarily experts in measuring the the uh, performance of these materials in terms of uh, uh, you know, uh, performance in the uh, catalysis. So sometimes there's a disconnect between the two. They make beautiful materials, but then when they char characterize it, then the, uh, there are flaws there. And you know, that helps us to use that as an example to show students, you know, even sometimes even the experts in the material science, but they are not experts in let's say like chemistry or few cells, right? So and that way students see that uh, you are an expert in one area, but you're not necessarily an expert in another area. It's okay to criticize that expert in that specific field, right? So they feel like more comfortable to do that. And we feel more comfortable for them to okay. criticize others' work. <laughs> I think the other thing that, that I do, so when I give a talk on campus or a seminar, in, in either my own department or other departments, I announce in class and, and tell them to come. And typically, out of you know 25 students, maybe one or two will come. But word gets around, so that's that's useful. Um, but basically, I think I mean as you all probably know, I mean, even other scholars are usually shocked at what goes on in an economic seminar uh, in terms of the level of spirited debate um, that happens. You know, you barely get past the first sentence, and I think that's also a place where it's helpful for students to see. You know, gee, she's not offended by that. Like, this is how we engage in spirits of, you know, academic inquiry. And so then, you know, it, it, it helps, I think, in the classroom for some students, you know, the ones who come or whatever, to then feel a bit more comfortable saying something critical. And then, of course, the, the key thing is just to react in a reasonable way because because the whole class is then assessing how's this going to, you know, oh, that seems super critical. How's that going to go over? And if, if you know, you're very sort of receptive to that, that actually does help, um, I think, to, 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 make the, to, to bring other students into you know, the, the level of, OK, it's, it's OK to, to both admit I don't know something or to, to say something that might be a little bit challenging. If I, if I may jump in, I, I think this also comes down to how we teach. So if you assign an article, and it's just um, like, you know, it's a syllabus, and you're not really teaching critical reading as you're citing the articles, right? They, they read them, you discuss them. The, the focus of some of the conversation in the classroom is the construction of the article. And when you assign your own work, you can talk about, these are some of the problems that I had when I was working on this piece. These are some of the ways that I resolved those problems. Do you see things that I haven't yet resolved? Is it unclear to you? I remember when um, my first book came out, and I was so excited, and people kept saying to me, this is so clear. Anybody could read this. It's, you know, your writing is amazing. 
And then when I shared it with people who weren't academics, they all frowned and said, are you ever going to write a book that anybody could read? Like, yeah. So that idea of audience is incredibly important. And we lose ourselves so often in who we're writing for because of the pressure to do the standard academic jargon journal thing. So there's a way in which um, being able to invite students into the critique of the paper you know, where does it get too jargony? Where is it like? So this has already been peer reviewed. We know it's a good article. Now let's look at what's inaccessible, what's problematic. Let's kind of take that apart. And if that's a regular part of your conversations, then making it a part of the conversation for your own article is not that much different. Mm -hmm. That's correct. So other thoughts on this? Um, especially for folks who came in late, we've been talking about um, how to bring your scholarship into a classroom, and some of that is, you know, assigning your own work. Some of that is teaching from your own uh, expertise, uh, current uh, work in the field, or theoretical issues that you're dealing with. We've talked about it in terms of epistemology and how you teach. But are there other kinds of um, complications that you've experienced in bringing scholarship into the classroom that you've learned to work around or maybe you haven't learned to work around? Let's say you're assigning a journal article instead of a chapter textbook, for example. Are there any specific expectations? Like you expect the student to read the article and think critically? Did you have them? I don't know, more focus on one article per se. I, think, I feel like if I try to do that a few times, I get bogged down in the details instead of the bigger picture. So how would you go about doing that if you wanted to develop your own course specifically for articles as opposed to textbook chapters? Is there one way or another that's more effective? So are you asking about how many competing points of view on a topic? I'm yeah. not sure I understand. Yeah, I would say that, right? Rather than, for example, like instrumental analysis, you have like one chapter on gas chromatography, and then you, and then in an upper level course, you could assign five or six different papers that approach that on different perspectives and try to get that too. So. Yeah, yes, it is different perspectives, but it's also different applications of the work as well. So I think that for upper level courses, would there be a difference between applied knowledge and fundamental knowledge in this regard to and what expectations would you have a student going into like a 400 level course, for example? So like assigning a paper versus a chapter. So if you have any experience with that. Does anyone in the room want to speak to that? Yeah. One thing to consider is, is the big difference between the concept of the code in the natural sciences versus other fields. Because I'm, I'm in the biology department, I'm developing in biology, in molecular biology, in these reference level courses. And I don't rely on textbooks just simply because textbooks can't keep up with where the field is. So in this case, uh, this might be what, what you're referring to. Yeah. I assign articles not necessarily to generate debates or I mean, if you don't have debates, at least in my field, there's right and wrong and you know, try to figure out what the answer is. So we are assigning articles because that's where the current cutting edge information is. So we're not trying to generate controversy or discuss things. It's just if you want to learn where the field is at, then you have to yeah. study the, the side of the literature. So in that case, the, I do have a lot of science of the literature and we go through it and if they have produced a paper, great. That's not all I'm saying. It's very appreciate to analyze it, but if I'm using it as a patient for the material, not for generating controversy. Plus, you'll define what you mean. The purpose of that science is that it makes you of what you want to say again. The next, so for the, so the I've had articles based courses. Sort of, there's, there's two types. One was the economics and aging course that I talked about earlier, and then I had a course here on the global crisis. And so basically the syllabus each week was topical, and, and in those situations, and there's no textbook, um, and, and in, in both cases I, I had a collection of articles, usually three, four, five, um, that did try to 
think about different aspects of uh, the topic, whether it was the failure of Lehman Brothers or um, you know sort of pension plans in the aging force, um, or you know Medicare, for instance. Um, so then I would use different articles, and um, it's not necessarily that they're fighting at each other, but but there's also that there's always through our scholarship advancement, um, and so there's always something more to discuss on a topic. Um, in, in my view, whether it's in the sciences or not, there's always advancement that happens uh, through articles, and so um, I think it's but it's important to assign multiple ones. I think. Can we go back to the comment on the salary teacher? No, that's just where I wanted to yeah. go back to Tony's uh, comment about um, the relationship of the scholar teacher ideal to the pragmatics of our lives and to the value system that we create with regard to those who teach but don't do research and those who. Um, do. And I don't like using the word research, but I realize that we got people who do scholarship that isn't research. Right? So, so people who are involved in scholarship or research, people who don't, who are just teachers, and then the scholar teacher ideal, and how that is um, the kind of the politics of that for departments and colleges and for AU. Do you want to pick that up? I'd be happy to. Yeah. It's, it's, an inter it's, it's a really interesting topic to me uh, in that I don't think it's driven at the faculty level. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't think we as individual faculty think that way. I think what we do is we do what we do. Mm -hmm. We study what we study and we enter it primarily from what we've seen other people do, uh, especially when you were training and you were young coming into it. But I think the university has a perspective. The current perspective of this university is we have faculty who buy out their classes and they don't teach. They do research, and we have a number of those. And we have other faculty who do not do research at all, and they're evaluated and they're hired for and are evaluated for their teaching. The majority of, and that's changed over time as well, uh, the number, the percent, it's department specific. The majority of us are hired because we're perceived as good scholars and good teachers. I mean, when you sit on search committees, that you're looking for people who can satisfy, you want to bring those individuals in. So we really have a three-pronged system. I think our university does. I don't know all universities do, and it's fluid over time. But given that we have that here, how do we treat those three in, three groups of individuals? Well, we treat the term top and four. I think, in terms of what they can get and how traditionally they've been given governance issues and things such as that. The group that are doing research only, they do research. <laughs> and you don't see them in the classroom. Again, most others are, are in the middle. And the issue then is, should we hire people who are best at both? Yes, right? For all things equal, you hire the very best you can get in. But what about the people that are already here? What do we do with individuals who are solid scientists, but also teach, but they're not that good at teaching, or they're wonderful at teaching, but they're not that good at science. So the universal perspective, I think, is that we want everybody to raise their levels. And if we do that, we have to have resources. You have to, and I'm not just talking about money, we're just talking about all sorts of resources to bring scholars, people to scholarly levels, although we have to define what those criteria are. It defines what a great scholar is and what a great teacher is. But I see it as a really interesting system that somehow we evolve into that system here at AU right now. We have that three three headed uh, thing here. And uh, the issue is is that the, it really comes to the issue. Did you read any of you read that Northwest? I know Angela did. Uh, but it's, they asked the question of. Is there a relationship between being a super scholar and a super teacher? And there is not. Uh, and is a poor scholar a poor? There's no relationship among these. And the issue is, do this, this universities use this as a recruitment tool? That they indicate that we have a scholar teacher idea, and we're putting the. Am I reading this right? Yes. 
that are we putting the very best scholars in our classes because they're going to be the very best teachers? So I, think and, I mean, I think we're getting a little, I don't know, bogged down on the terminology is the right word, but I mean, you know, as, and, and again, this is from my perspective, when I think about scholarship, I think of the spirit of inquiry, and I think that applies to absolutely everybody. I mean, that is a, a sort of approach to, um, you know, teaching life understanding that, that transcends just, you know, sort of doing, you know, basic science or research or whatever, right? So, I mean, somebody who is, is hired into our teaching only sort of track, probably, you know, if they have a spirit of inquiry, that's, you know, they're going on, you know, in, in their downtime, they're going to conferences on pedagogy and things like that. They have a spirit of inquiry that is, you know, similar in scholarship to... Yeah, that's not, that's not what they're saying. They're saying no. uh, that's, no. that, and I completely agree with you, is that independent, uh, I mm. think having that curiosity and that passion and that job, that's absolute. That's not what these individuals are saying. The ones that are talking about the scholarship track, they're talking about you are a scholar in a field. Well, I think the problem is that, that again, there are buzzwords all over the place, and then, you know, we've got this big data thing that roams around as well. Um, you know, there, there's lots of buzz phrases, and some of what we as a collective group have a responsibility to do is to help folks to understand what that means, right? So, so. You know, people hear scholar teacher, and as we started off, it means different things to different people. And so, so having the, the benefit of having a discussion is to try to get to a collective understanding of it. But you know, I wouldn't go so far as to say, well, that's not what they think. Maybe they just haven't heard that you know, scholar teacher can mean you know, it can be uh, inclusive. It doesn't have to be you know, divisive or exclusive. And I think it's human nature to want to divide. Um, or you know, sort of say, oh, this is you know, this is right, this is wrong, as opposed to saying, well, how do we you know create a, a, an environment that's inclusive and, and and recognizes the value of all the people who are contributing to um, right. you know the, the spirit of inquiry. So if I may jump in, I think that uh, I love the pragmatic idealism of thinking of everyone who has a spirit of inquiry as being a scholar. But at AU, if you're going to get Scholar Teacher of the Year award, it's because you are doing scholarship and you're getting good teaching evaluations on those sets, right? That's what it means. Uh, it's a pretty narrow slice. So we can expand it and think about it in as many ways as we'd like. I think that's a helpful conversation. But where administration is concerned, it means something very specific. Um, it, it, uh, it doesn't, so it doesn't include all of this. And there is, um, you know, I think we have to uh, kind of wake ourselves up to constantly be able to hold the fact that academia is a corporation, that we work in a corporation that's really interested in particular economic aspects of it. And so having faculty who can bring in big grants and Fine, you know, have your office, don't teach, right? And yet it can't be only that because those are expensive people to have. Um, it's a, a corporation that needs to be making money. And so hiring people that get paid less as term and adjunct to fill in classes is where that model started. And then it became all. Oh, now we have faculty who have all the responsibilities of tenured line faculty without the security of tenure. So there's a political struggle in there as well that speaks to how how it is we have shifted the meaning of academia within a corporatized framework. I, I, that's why I'm understanding this. Well, I think, I'm not saying that's my position. Uh, what, what I'm saying is I think when we look at the university, it's made up of those groups of people. No, no, no. That there's a distribution, and every year there's one scholar teacher of the year. So, so I mean, it's not you know the, the notion that everybody aspires to be that one person and should. I don't think anybody aspires to be no, that person. No, that's what I mean. I have so, never thought exactly. of. Exactly. There's, 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 a, there's that's, an award. But that's the point: is that there's a distribution, and there's one. Right. You know, that describes one point on the distribution. But I haven't. I honestly have not heard anybody you know sort of say there shouldn't be a distribution. Well, well, I, I don't know. It's, it's fluid. 
I mean, 20 years ago, we didn't have term capital. We had few term capital. And furthermore, 20 years ago, you couldn't buy off classes. It was a different dynamic 20 years ago than it is today. And today, and I'm not saying any of those perspectives is wrong. It's just that's the perspective we have. So if, if what we have today is this three-pronged approach, and it may be multiple pronged, I only see three, then we have to be able to recognize that they get evaluated differently, and that you know they get their own. I think you said that the individuals who are in the term boundary line have to have access to all sorts of resources to make them better teachers, and the people are in the in the research only line they have a different set of resources. Those that probably make up the most dollars, which is this the scholar teacher combination, have to have resources to make sure that what we want in our recruitment is the same thing we want in our maintenance of our because to say we're only going to recruit the very best, and then when you have individuals that are here, that have been here for 20 years, and now they have a new provost, she goes, by God, Laura, you're going to do more research. All right? Those people say, go to hell. This is what I've been doing for the last 20 years, and it's worked out well. Am I wrong? I think there's definitely been a historic change. There's been a dramatic change. Uh, well, I don't know what the data are. Well, I don't, uh, yeah, certainly not the data. That's more question. Yeah. No, I just think it's a really interesting concept. Uh, but I also think that, getting back to the shop shop talk, is that this is all contingent upon the level, I believe, all contingent upon the level of the classes that we're talking about. Because I think there are different criteria for choice of faculty in different types of classes. So for some types of, and again, if, if you can get the very best scholars and the very best teachers teaching those lower level classes. They might not be the best teachers in those classes. So we as chairs and administrators, we, we want to put the very best in those classes. Do you know it's an endless tension because is, what happens and you end up with uh, often uh, lower division classes being taught by term and adjunct faculty, upper division graduate classes being taught by tenure long faculty, and then who's introducing you to the discipline and the department? People who haven't been in the discipline or the department perhaps as long as others. But it doesn't it's have to be that way, the right thing. No, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be, but I think that the tension that we've got. We've got a couple of signs in the back of the room that, uh, that we're over. So I wanted to just thank uh, Robin and Suzanne for joining me on this panel. Again, thanks to Adam and to Betsy for, uh, I said we're being, I should have said we're <laughs> uh, but I'm grateful to have been able to be here, if I may say that on behalf of all of us. And many thanks to everybody who came and for your thoughtful participation.